Seeing in second world countries an amazing situation where we have an epidemic of infectious disease and on top of that we are imposing an epidemic of chronic disease. So they're still having trouble with, you know, with pneumonia and with infectious diseases, but on top of that, they're starting now to have uh, obesity and diabetes, diabetes. This was an illustration of our first 10 days. I'm not here to give you a presentation of our research, but I just want to show you. This is absolutely compelling, actually. Here's what happened in the first 10 days of our treatment program on this in the Marshall Islands. And you can see that the average blood sugars were above 200. And that's why they're having so much trouble. They're not controlling it at all. And then after 10 days, it had dropped over 75, about 75 points in 10 days. This was a lifestyle. In fact, some of them, that were on, if they were on insulin, we had to take them off of the insulin. Friends, when I look at this, I think, how can that happen? I mean, how is that possible? And that's what I want to talk to you about because science is now starting to understand at the molecular level. The, the doctors, Davis, were talking last night and will be talking to you this afternoon, they tend to focus, and it's good, on the cellular level, and that's important. I want, to go, I want to go into the cell. I want to go down to the molecular biology and show you some of the astounding things that science is learning about why this happens and how it can happen and how it can happen to you or your friends. Now, in my work as a lifestyle medicine doctor, I, always, I hear this all the time. I've got bad genes. You know, I, I was born this way. My granddad had it. My grandma had it. My parents had it. And I've got it. It's in my genes. Nothing you can do about it. Well, that's not exactly true. In fact, that's very not true. The new science of epigenetics upon the genome is revealing that the choices that we make can change your genes. Now, if there's a scientist in the room or, that, or a doctor or a well-educated person, they're going to say, well, wait a minute, he's going too far. He just said you can change your genes. Well, I'm going to show you that you can change your genes, but you can't. We don't yet know how to change your DNA with, with lifestyle, but you can change your genes, and I'll show you that. And look at that next part. You can change the genes for your kids. And I want to, that's especially important to the younger ones in the audience today. So let's, let's do it. We're going to move fast. I have a lot to say. Watson and Crick. So a little history. Watson and Crick. Here's a picture. When Watson and Crick, who discovered the DNA helix structure, they won the Nobel Prize. I believe it was 1954, but it was in the 50s. And you can tell from the picture. It's a few years ago. And when I talk to people who are needing to make lifestyle change, they always want to know what and why. That's good. But what I want to do this morning is I want to share with you the how behind the what and the why. How does our body respond the way it does to the what and the why? Interesting. You see here a picture of someone's hand holding what? Three little hedgehogs. Three little hedgehogs. She had three of them. But I want to ask you a question. You know, every cell in our body has a copy of the same DNA, right? You know that we come from a single cell, and that cell divides and makes another cell. That makes another cell until pretty soon you've got trillions of cells. If every cell in our body has a copy of the same DNA, how does it produce such different tissue? How is it that some of it makes a nose? Some of it makes toes. And of course, in the, I don't have quills, but how is it that it happens? Did you know, do you know that, that in this ear, in my right ear, are all the genes necessary to make a toe? In, in my right ear, is all the genes necessary to make a tongue? Why is it in the ear instead of a toe or a tongue? 
I would look kind of strange with a tongue over here. We, 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 as we start to think about this a little bit, instead of just marveling at it, it's actually astounding. What it turns out is that of the 30,000 or so genes that we have in the human de genome in each cell, the vast majority are turned off and inactive. The vast majority of the cell of the DNA, the genes in this ear, is turned off and it and the ones that make a right ear are turned on. I'm glad it's not the left ear. You know, that would look a little strange, have two left ears. So the point I'm trying to get at is I'm wanting you to see that what I'm going to share with you is actually not as remarkable and as astounding and unbelievable as it first seems. To get there, we have to start thinking a little bit deeper here. Chromosomes. Do you realize? that what we actually inherit from mom and dad is not genes. We inherit chromosomes. Now the chromosomes do include DNA, of course, and the DNA contains genes. But the important point I want to make to you here is that we inherit chromosomes and only 50% of the chromosome is DNA. And like we often do sometimes in our first attempts at understanding a new subject, we oversimplified this. We thought that the DNA was the sum and substance. Turns out that it's only part of inheritance. That the other 50% of the chromosome is very important to inheritance as well. And that's what's exciting to me because it's that turns out that the other 50% may be more important than the DNA. Let's just do a little quick refresher. Remember your high school or college biology here. So here's the picture of the DNA. Uh, we sequenced the, all this thing. We now know we have about 30, say about 30,000 genes in the human DNA. About a decade ago we sequenced it. Genomics is a science that measures what we call the throughput or it measures gene expression. In other words, if you have 30,000 genes, and I have 30,000 genes in this, every cell in this ear here, I am very glad that all 30,000 of them are not being expressed. I mean, it would be a strange looking thing, not an ear. And what we do is the epigenome is the other 50% of the chromosome. That's the part that's responsible for controlling gene expression. So it's the proteins and the other molecules besides the DNA that sits upon the DNA, if you will, and controls the expression of the genes. Thank God. Because if we had no control, I mean, I don't know if you've ever driven a vehicle that you lost control. The, the, the gas wouldn't work. It was just the pedal was just on the floor. You couldn't, you couldn't do anything about it. It's a strange and terrible feeling. And so the epigenome is like the gas pedal and the brake pedal on the DNA expression. Here we have a picture magnified 73,000 times of the nucleus of a cell. You can see this sort of black, this, yeah, well, sort of black stuff in there. That's called chromatin. Chromatin is a chromosome when it's, when it's loosened up and and being available for gene expression. When it's all tight, it cannot, it can't, I'll show you that, it cannot get gene expression going on. Now think about this. The, if you were to take the DNA and stretch it out from one cell, stretch it out, it's about 10 feet long, about three meters. If you take that three meters long piece of molecule roll it all up and stick it into less than one micrometer sphere. The nucleus that, it, that we showed the picture of is, a, is less than one micrometer in diameter. And inside there is a 10 foot long piece of, of DNA with 30,000 genes. And, and a, instructions come from, from, from somewhere, maybe from uh, the insulin, which is a hormone, right? A hormone that signals something to the beta cells. The insulin comes and makes a signal to your pancreatic beta cell and says, hey, 
Make us a whole lot of copies of gene number 14,273. Quick. He said, oh my goodness, which one? There's 30,000 of these things he wants. Which one did he say? 14,723. So, but it happened just like that. The, the DNA is organized in a very careful and special way. And I have a little picture here of it. Let me blow that up. This is a, is a three-dimensional uh, representation of a histone molecule. The histone molecule is basically one of the main molecules that the DNA is organized around it. It's sort of, you know, and if you've got a garden hose in your garden, you probably, like me, you, you, you probably roll it up. I mean, that's what, I, I've never actually seen anybody not roll up a garden hose. It just seems like that's how you organize it. It's long, you need to keep it in one place. Well, that's how the DNA is organized. It's rolled up on histones. But these histones have some other qualities, too. They have these little tails that uh, when the, I don't know how much you know about uh, biochemistry, but, but basically when a, a, a protein has a particular shape, a conformation we call it, and when you add a molecule, if you, you can add a, a uh, hydroxy, an OH, to the protein structure, it actually changes it. It'll change its conformation. And so by adding a methyl group, or an, actually in this case it's an acyl group on the tail, it changes the conformation of the histone, causes it to release the DNA and open it up so that the PCR polymerase chain reaction can take place and you can make a copy of the gene. Because as you know, it takes messenger RNA, right? You have to make a copy of messenger RNA to, to transcribe the DNA. So here's a little schematic. Here's the chromosome. You probably recognize that. There's 23 of these things, right, in, in a cell. These, they look like a little X because actually they're attached in the middle at the centromere. And, uh, and there's one on this side and one on the other side. And here you can see this is made, this, this chromatin I was telling you about. When, when the chromosome sort of unravels, it's called chromatin. And that actually turns out to be a DNA helix and you, we can methylize, the, put a methyl group on the DNA, one of the sugars, and uh, that will actually make a signal to transcribe or not. And then here's the histones, and see how tight this is right here, but over here after we put the, the little um, tail on, we put this epigenetic factor on the tail, then the, it opens up. Okay, well that's, a, uh, that's sufficient for you get the concept, okay? Now, the epigenome, then, these molecules that are in the chromosome but not the DNA, they control or modulate the effect of the genetics or the genes that you're born with. And the, it's a two-way street because those proteins themselves are made by the genes. And so it's, it's a, there's a very intimate dance here, if you want to say, an embrace, however you, whatever you're... you're, you're you want to use as your illustration, but, but the, they, they affect each other. By the way, every one of the, my slides, I have uh, a citation for you if you wanted to read the article and, and see this for yourself. This happens to be from the Nature uh, 2007. And what Dr. Feinberg has said in this article is absolutely astounding. This is cutting edge medicine. He says epigenetics is at the center of modern medicine. And, and what he says is it helps explain this. It's like the holy grail of physics. You know, they're looking for that, for that one formula, that one approach that will explain the three main forces. And, 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 and theoretical physicists, and I'm not a theoretical physicist, but I agree with him, they believe there, that there is a unified theory for physics, and I believe so too. I don't know what it is. But this is almost like the, the, the unified theory of human aging, human disease, human health. Because epigenetics can explain the relationship between your genetic background, the environment, aging, and disease. And that's tremendously powerful. Now, here's, I'm going to show you how that connects with the Adventist health message as soon as we get a little bit further here. So the genes can be turned on and off by environmental influences, right? 
Now, the switch settings are covalent bonds. Covalent bonds in chemistry means there's an actual sharing of electrons, so it's, an, it's a stable bond. It doesn't, it doesn't change without like an enzyme or something changing it. So it's a stable bond, but it is reversible. That's important to keep in mind. So these switches, they are set in the chromosome or the epigenome. They are set by environmental influences. And I want to illustrate that by this powerful study that was done on mice. I'm going to make a progression. I'm going to start with mice. I'm going to show you a couple of studies and I'm going to end up with the human studies, okay? Now one of these mice on this picture here is very expensive. More expensive than any vehicle in the parking lot or on the street. Because one of these has been genetically engineered. And this mouse has been genetically engineered so that built into its genome now that, that it passes on generation to generation are genes that cause it to get obese and get diabetes and get heart disease and get lots of these diseases that we want to study. It happens to be the beautiful blonde. The, it's, you could maybe guess that because she's a little big. She's bigger than the ordinary mouse there next to her. But uh, one of the interesting things is that her, these genetic changes cause the coat of the mouse to be a sort of a uh, bland, blonde, you know, whatever you, tan color. Well, these mice were engineered, to, this agouti mouse was engineered to study drugs and, and treatments for, for these diseases. But about a, uh, a decade ago, a researcher and his, uh, one of his uh, graduate students got the idea of, why don't we try, what if we were to try using lifestyle, well, suppose we use diet to try and treat on these mice. And they came up with a uh, special diet that they gave the, the mother uh, and they wanted to see the effect primarily how it would be transmitted to the, ch to the offspring, so they fed it to the mouse while she was pregnant. And when the baby was born to this mouse, there was an earthquake, an earthquake in genetics, because what happened was the baby didn't even look like mama. It not only was it not obese, not only did it not have a tendency to get diabetes, it didn't even have the strange color or the unusual color of the coat. You can see it looked like a regular mouse. In fact, they probably were wondering who the father was and they did a paternal a little DNA testing. Sure enough, it has the same genes. The genes that were engineered into that mouse are still in that mouse. But they are not causing that mouse to get obese or to get diabetes or to get heart disease. Amen. Amen. And how did they change that? With a diet. Yeah, that's right. Amen. I'm like, praise God. I mean, we know, we, yeah, we know from observations, we've seen people change their diet and change, but, but we're starting to understand at the molecular level how it happens. You know, I've often wondered, how is it, this is a, this is a little side comment, uh, but because sometimes when I give this talk, I just get, I get excited. This, is, this gives me chili bumps. But I, I think, you know, I've, heard, I've read where Ellen White says that it, towards the end of time, at the close of time, that the health message and the Sabbath is going to become the topic of the world. I'm like, how can that happen? Why? Is, how could that happen? I mean, sometimes you talk to people and it seems like they're absolutely not interested in health. And this is going to become a major topic. And I believe this is part of it. Because the repercussions of this is still reverberating. It's still percolating up. It's going to create a tremendous interest in lifestyle change and Seventh-day Adventists are the experts. Amen. If we will implement what we know, if we will practice what we know, if we will become experts, we can be the experts. So, what the researchers had to say about this was that this effect they noticed was heritable for up to three to four generations. Now, if you're a Bible student, you've got to recognize that phraseology. And I didn't tell them to say that. Up to three to four generations of inheritance of this effect. 
And this DNA methylating diet that they fed is very complex. It was primarily folic acid, which is very high in plants. So a little bit more to it than that. But the implications are really staggering. Think about that. If I am fertile, that's the, science, that's the biological proper term for meaning I can still have children. If I can have children, which I can't, but you, some of you can, you can actually program your next generation in a positive way, giving them advantages in health that they couldn't have any other way. And it isn't complicated, but it does take a daily habitual lifestyle. Transgressions have their effect. Now I want to show you another study. So I'm going to move from mice to rats. So we're going to be a little bit bigger, but still. And this was published in uh, 2008, the Journal of Neuroscience, uh, Dr. Chang and team. And the title was Maternal High Fat Diet and Fetal Programming. Increased proliferation of hypothalamic peptide producing neurons that increase risk for overeating and obesity. What we have here is a, 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 in one schematic what they did. Here's a, here's a rat who's pregnant. You can see the little picture there of her uterus with a developing fetus. And this mother is fed an HF, a high fat diet, HFD. So they gave this mother a high fat diet while she was gestating. This intricate science and the intricate biology that they did is amazing. But they were able to actually trace in the developing fetus now, not in the mother, in the developing fetus, they were able to trace that there was an overexpression of genes on chromosome 3 that led to the production, ultimately, of peptides that led to an overabundance of cells in the hypothalamus that produce, they were cells that actually produce signals to the organism to eat and to prefer high fat. And so look, here's, so here was the high fat diet led to this neurogenesis, the gen, that means the proliferation of, of brain cells. Do you realize what this is saying? This is saying that the mother's diet changed the anatomical structure of the baby's brain in a way that affected its behavior. Yeah, this is, this is serious stuff. And so then the cells migrated into the brain. They, they began their peptide expression. That's what those cells do. They produce these, these peptides are, in essence, signals. And the offspring, here's the phenotype means the behavior or the, you know, the re expression. And, and so what did they find? Blood lipids were higher, blood fats. That's unhealthy, by the way, if you don't know that. Uh, fo increased food intake. Increased preference for fat for food. Early, uh, in, uh, earlier onset of puberty. You're, are, you, are you recognizing any of these patterns? Uh, increased body weight. When this study was published and the results were presented at um, the American Heart Association was having meetings, national meetings, and, and one of the leaders in the American Heart Association made a statement and it made the paper. And she says, you know, the implications of this study may have great, it may have great implications for the causes of America's obesity epidemic and our epidemic of heart disease and diabetes. Because let me ask you, what is the fat content of the average fast food meal served in America. Well, it just, let's just make it real scientific. It's sky high. I'm just teasing. Anyway, it's, it's way too high. It might be 60%. depends on what you eat. You might be able, if you're, it's increasingly getting that if you're very careful, you might be able to get a meal that's under 30% fat content, but you will have to work at that if you're going to buy it at a fast food prepared food place. And the Women's Health Initiative study, which took $140 million, was published showing that if you drop your fat content from 37% in the control group to 28% in the treatment group, it makes no difference in heart attack and heart disease. And so the paper came out with the headline was, low fat diet makes no difference. 
Guess what? 28% is not low fat. In fact, they themselves were shooting for 20% and they missed it. Which, by the way, let me just say, as a lifestyle medicine practitioner, you have to have intensive treatment to have successful lifestyle treatment. It cannot be namby-pamby, well, take the skin off the chicken. It's got to be intense changes in lifestyle. Something like the Davises are sharing with you. Okay? Now, this one's kind of amazing. This is a human study. You know, I don't have a, a clock, so I don't know where we are. Is it, what, 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 can somebody tell me where a benchmark, what time is it? Five of nine? Thank you. Uh, this study is done uh, in Sweden, I believe it was, in, uh, north of the, uh, the northern part of the country. And it just so happens, you know, Sweden has been um, the, uh, uh, um, national, they've had national health. Anyway, they have some great health records that we don't have in most of the world. And they were able, because of their remarkable fidelity of the records that they've had, um, they were able to trace the effects from food availability in one generation to health effects two generations later. And what they found was that on the years that the uh, crops were abundant, overly abundant, that, and so the, the population tended to what? Tended to eat more. Maybe we might, maybe overeat, I don't know, but they ate, they had better nutrition in the sense of more abundant, that two, in the grandchildren, there was an increased risk of diabetes and, and uh, heart disease. So this is a hint, this isn't proof yet, but this is a pretty strong hint that the same effects are working in humans, right? Because there's a danger. It, if we look at something that happened in a mouse, we not, I'm not a mouse. You know, you're not a mouse. It might apply and it might not. So you need to, you do a lot of work in animals, but eventually you've got to bring it to a human being. You've got to see it work in humans. And that's why I'm making this progression for you. Oh, here was the little, uh, uh, the difference that they could see, the longevity. The effect of longevity was significant. And by the way, this is interesting, it was sex specific. If the grandmother had been in puberty or around the age of puberty, about the time of this abundance of, of harvest, then the granddaughter would be affected, but not the grandson. If the grandfather was uh, at the, around the age of puberty, about the time of this abundance, the grandson would have an effect. So, so this is exciting. Well, us scientists, we love to figure out why stuff works like it does. You know? It's like, why is it sex specific? And why does it seem to be that it's the, the abundance during the particular time around puberty? We don't know these things yet. Uh, maybe we'll, we won't find out. I don't know. Now, nutrigenomics is a science built around this fact that nutrients change gene expression. And of course, in typical reductionistic approach, what science is trying to do is to design a nutrient that will produce a certain desired genomic effect. You know, that's, that's, that's the reductionistic approach. Say, okay, can I design a nutrient that I can give you that will cause a certain gene to be expressed or not expressed? And I'm not opposed to that. But that isn't where the real benefits of this science is. The real benefit is the dietary pattern. The dietary pattern is what we need. And by the way, diet, do you notice this? Exerts the strongest effect on gene expression. If you start exercising, we can prove, we know that it will change gene expression. It will change the anatomy of your brain. We can actually, we can actually observe on scans of your brain the effect of exercise in your life. And it's especially helpful in the hippocampus. That's the part of the brain that forms memory. Listen, friends, there really are tangible, specific benefits to a healthy lifestyle. And I'm talking to myself because 
I'm a busy guy, like most of you, and I have a tendency not to get the adequate amount of exercise. I have to do it. It's medicine. It's not only medicine, it's part, as I'm going to talk in the 11 o'clock, it's part of how I properly reflect the character of God to the world. How can I, do you want to give a faulty demonstration to the universe? I mean, not intentionally. We don't intentionally want to do that, do we? And so we need to make some of these practical things. And what I'm showing you this morning is, I'm showing you why, a part of why, when we make these changes, those changes change us, and I'm going to show you in a minute, it literally changes you. You are a different being. You are, your cells are different. You are different if you make appropriate lifestyle changes. Here's a study now, the last one I'm going to show you. This is from humans. This was published by Dr. Dean Ornish, uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Science in June of 2008. This is a remarkable study because what they did was, well, let's just read it. Changes in prostate gene expression in men undergoing an intensive nutrition and lifestyle intervention. So what they did was they had 30 men with prostate cancer. Now, you probably know prostate cancer is on the increase. It's not hard to find 30 men with prostate cancer, I'm sorry to say. And it tends to be run in families. If your father had it, that's a risk factor for you. So there's some, there's some you know, inheritance to this thing. And what they did was they had these men undergo a lifestyle change program. In fact, it's basically the same intervention that Dr. Ornish has previously shown can reverse heart disease. But now we're using it to see what happens in gene expression in prostate cancer, and this is absolutely amazing. So what we see here is that, that we're looking here at cardiovascular risk factors and then psychological functioning and so forth. And, uh, and the change at three months. Well, let me just show you one here. The, the LDL, the bad cholesterol dropped 34 points. That's, that's wonderful. You might get that much drop with a good medication. Maybe, it might take more than one. 45 point drop in total cholesterol. Triglycerides went down. Everything, in essence, everything got better. This would have been a, a wonderful, we could have stopped right there and said, wow, this is, this is a worthwhile treatment. But we haven't even got to what we're really treating. We're, we're not treating heart disease. Now this is something called a heat map. What we, this is how we take a sort of a global look at gene expression changes. And what you'll see here is there's a column there's a column on the left-hand side before intervention. Each column is one man. And the color for, and then across the rows is genes. And the color for each one of those little boxes, or a large pixel, the color is based on the amount of gene expression. If there's a lot of gene expression, it'll be a dark red or, or more black type color. If there's very little gene expression, it'll be light colored. See the light colored ones? Now, so then you take a global look, you can see that before and after the intervention, there's a clear change, isn't there? There's a, it's what we call cooler. Over here, these genes that are listed, and they, they turned out there were hundreds of them that they measured. Hundreds of genes were had at a major change in gene expression in 90 days on a lifestyle intervention program. We just, that needs to soak in just a little bit. Can diet change your genes? Don't let anyone tell you it can't. It changes gene expression, and that's far more important than changing the DNA alone. In fact, we could actually change the DNA ex uh, sequence in your body, and if the gene wasn't getting expressed, it wouldn't have any effect. Because the gene has to be expressed to have any effect. So what we're talking about here is change in gene expression is yes, I'm not, I'm not claiming there's any change in the DNA sequence. That's, we, we, we know that's, we don't have any reason to believe that can happen. I need to draw to a close here. So I'm going to sort of go fast over this, but basically I want to show you this, that what's happened, this is the reductionistic approach. We get a pathway in, 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 the, in human physiology and we figure it out how it works, A, B, C, D, E, and we figure, okay, if we want to change this, we just need to block one of these points. If we can block between A and B, or if we can block between B and C, or we can block between C and D, if we can block one of these, we could stop this. Well, guess what? It's a little more complicated than that. It turns out that in almost all of these diseases and conditions we're talking about, 
there is a network, not a linear pathway. They are connected in so many ways. Dr. Campbell, Colin Campbell, 40 years, each, uh, over 40 years of a million dollars or more of NIH funding for studies, a, a, a preeminent researcher. And he says, you know, every time we looked for a mechanism, we found one. Well, now you say, wow, they're really good. Well, that's true, but they're good, but that's a problem. If there is apparently an unlimited number of mechanisms that causes obesity, you're not going to be able to block one and stop it. You have to have a pattern of change. You have to change the system state. So I'm going to <coughs> go on quickly. <coughs> Common forms of diseases represent states of a network. <coughs> Focusing on single genes will never reveal the effective way to treat or prevent the disease. <coughs> Excuse me. In fact, the complexity introduced by our knowledge now of epigenetics is like comparing DNA sequence to an abacus and the epigenome to a supercomputer. The epigenome has shown us that this process is mag orders of magnitude more complex than the sequence of the DNA. Now, that, that, that's, scientists are not daunted by that. That just means we have another a uh, few millennia of work to do. We're very happy to do this. We'll figure this out. But it isn't going to happen anytime real soon. However, as we've already seen, as the Dean Ornish study showed, you can make doable changes, a lifestyle change, a diet change, and you can change gene expression in positive ways. And that's the good news. Here, I love this quote by Dr. Jertle. Dr. Jertle, in his uh, student were the ones that did the Goody Mouse experiment, started this. He says, epigenetics is proving we have some responsibility for the integrity of our genome. Before, genes predetermine outcomes. Now, everything we do, everything we eat or smoke can affect our gene expression and that of future generations. Epigenetics introduces what? The concept of free will into our idea of genetics. Yeah. Of course, as Christians, as health reformers, as change agents, this is exciting. Amen. Amen. He's saying, here's a leading scientist in the field of genetics saying, free will has an impact on the cellular metabolism at the molecular level. And they previously said that diet is one of the strongest effects we know. And that's why they're using nu design nutrients, nutrigenomics, designing nutrients to create specific changes. So what that boils down to in practical terms is that when you're looking at your health, let's say you want to have good health, or you want to help your neighbor have good health. By the way, let me just say right there. Oops, I went the wrong way. Uh, I want to make a little commentary point right here. The best way to change your health is to focus on helping someone else have good health. That's right. If you will help someone else, I will tell you, it will motivate you. It will give you persuasion with heaven. When you go and ask, give me bread, my neighbor, my neighbor has come, I don't have any bread. You will knock on that door in the middle of the night and wake that man up in heaven and he will give you bread. That's what Jesus said. And so, you want to have better health, find someone that needs improvement in their health, help that person, and you will have better health. Okay, well, so, health. DNA sequence has about 10%. About 10% is all the influence it has. DNA is raw material for the epigenome. DNA is raw material for the epigenome. 10%. Medical care. Oh, I, don't, I better not go off in that. I, this makes me, I just get so frustrated. There was so much focus on such a tiny piece of what matters in health. We could insure the world. We could give Medicare and Medicaid to the world. It will not make a much change in health. Medical care 
only has about 10% effect on health. The environment. They're having a, some very bad environmental things happening right now in northern Japan. And that's going to affect the health for some people. But it's only 10% overall. Environment is only about 10% also. And that leaves lifestyle, the epigenome, with about a 70% effect. And that's good news. Because you probably couldn't do, a lot of those people in Japan, for example, there was nothing they could do about this. this they were living there doing the normal things that people need to do, and this happened. You know? So, environment, you don't have a lot of control over. However, I will say one thing. Oh, I don't want to be offensive. I mean, I'm just getting to know you, and you're, you know, hopefully I'm going to, we're going to be friends. But you want me to be honest, don't you? Yes. There's a reason why God's people have been told that we need to get out of the cities. Yes. Now, we need to do it in a proper and orderly way. We, we don't need a, like a, some kind of a, a mad rush for the, for the country, but we need to be following the counsel as God opens the way, my friend, I encourage you to do like I've done. I have deliberately, intentionally, I live in the country. But I labor for the cities. If we leave the, the cities and abandon them, we are just as faulty as if we stay there and think we're going to evangelize them like Lot did. It isn't a successful system. The Lot system doesn't work. But the Enoch system will work. And so I just want to say that little thing there. What's the time now? Oh, I've got to quit. All right. This must be my two or three last slides. So what have I said? Changing your diet and your lifestyle does what? It changes your epigenome. It makes covalent bond changes to histones, to, to the DNA, puts those methyl groups on there. That and what? That changes gene expression, the expression of your genes. And that then changes you. It literally changes you. You have different cells. You have different functioning cells. I like to share that when I'm giving these talks, see this is, I've been showing you in essence what is the, the entering wedge. We've been talking about the science that supports the health message. And so I, if I stop right now talking to the, to uh, doing health evangelism, I, I have, it's like I brought them right up to the, to the fence and didn't open the gate. So let's talk about how I do that. Maybe you can do this. What I'll often say to a, to a maybe even a secular audience right about now is say, you know, recognizing that the scriptures do not hold the same place in everyone's worldview. I used to be an antagonistic agnostic. I'm familiar with what it means to be an unbeliever. And I respect unbelievers, especially those that are intellectually honest. But nonetheless, it's interesting to examine some of the basic ideas found in ancient writings that are phenomenally consistent with the latest genetic science. That's what I'll say, something like that. And so now they're like, oh, okay, well, what is this? Well, in Genesis 129, we read what the original diet was. And God said, Behold, I've given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, every tree, in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for food. That's King James, meat means food. They use the term flesh for what we call meat. So this is saying it shall be to you for food. How about the future diet? We can read about this in Isaiah 11. 7 through 9, and it says, And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat, what? Straw like the ox. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. Well, it's pretty obvious if you believe that there's going to be heaven, it's not going to continue to be killing. So, I mean, nobody really contests this that believes some of the basic concepts of, of heaven. And then this one, I forgot to mention, but in the study that Dean Ornish did, they looked at something else very exciting, telomeres. Turns out that on these chromosomes, there's a little tail, and it has these telomeres on it, which is a sequence of DNA. And every time that the cell divides and that chromosome is reproduced, this tail is shortened. 
It takes off some of those telomeres, and it ends up limiting how long or how many times the chromosome can be reproduced, can be duplicated. But there's an enzyme that puts this back on, okay, telomerase. And they found that in those men, after 90 days on this lifestyle program, the telomerase activity was 30% higher. Diet was changing the cellular longevity or lifespan of cells. That's exciting. Well, now, it's also very consistent with Scripture. Let me show you something interesting. And the Lord, this is in Genesis 3, 22, 24. And the Lord God said, lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims, flaming sword to keep the way of the tree of life. My friends, is it possible? This is not proof. This is an interesting, this is an interesting parallel. Is it not interesting? that we see evidence in science that diet can change telomerase activity and the Bible says that the tree of life can produce longevity. It's totally consistent, is my point. You know, we need to take a fresh look. We need to take a fresh look at the Bible. That's what we're trying to do, and get people to take a fresh look. Uh, so, I want to close with this slide right here. The implications of health reform. I'm suggesting to you that this science validates inspired statements that were not that long ago considered uneducated foolishness. Do you know Ellen White said that there's power in the gospel to overcome every inherited or cultivated tendency to evil? And science for many years said that is crazy, to overcome inherited tendencies to evil? And now we see, at the molecular level, evidence that that is true. And how is the evidence that you can best make those changes? by diet. And she makes a statement that those of us who fail to overcome on the point of diet may fail to overcome on many other points. It's all consistent with the science, my friends. That's, what I'm that's my bottom line message, is that, that the, the, the information from Revelation is consistent with the latest science. It provides a strong entering wedge for the health reform message. I can go into audiences and talk about genetics and epigenetics that would never invite me to come and talk about the Bible. But when I get through talking about the science, as I showed you, I point out, is it not interesting how consistent this is with God's word? Maybe you should take another look, like I did a few decades ago. It encourages us to adopt and follow these reforms ourselves, not abandon them. This is not time to abandon the truths we've been given, but time to embrace them and be changed by them. And it makes us proud, hopefully in a good way, of our church's health reform message. And we're not embarrassed about it. Amen. Brethren, I'm out of time. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for letting me share with you. Can we have prayer together? Let's, let's where possible, let's kneel as we come to the Lord. Dear Father in heaven, how true the observation in thy word that we are wonderfully and fearfully made. These bodies that you've given us, these, this habitation for your Holy Spirit, this, this vessel for uh, this marvelous organ of the brain that we'll be talking about at 11 o'clock, this, this marvelous vehicle for us as a human being to reflect your image, to do thy will, to have a part in restoring harmony and peace to the universe. Thank you for the marvelous truths from modern science. Yes, there are many ways science gets it wrong, but there are many ways that they get it right. And in this case, Lord, we, we have reason to believe this is right because it's so consistent with your word, so empowering in its effect. So bless us, each one today, Lord. May we commit ourselves more fully to following the counsel that we have to live a healthful lifestyle more and more in harmony with your original plan of diet and activity in nature. 
Bless these dear folk, I pray, in this auditorium, any who might be listening. Touch each individual heart, I pray in Jesus' name, and thank you. Amen.